This time on Fifth Gear. Karun Chandrak and I test four stripped down sports cars that can out accelerate supercars, but at 50 grand, won't break the bank. Fabulous to drive. <laughs> the team tests Ford's latest Fiesta ST. The last version pushed the boundaries for hot hatch handling, so will its replacement be as good? And more importantly, has my driving finally broken one of my co presenters? Get out of the car. If you, you're not going to vomit. <laughs> Vicky test drives three second-hand alternatives to the Fiesta ST that deliver the same thrills, yet cost only £5,000 each. One of the greatest hot hatches ever made. Modding mechanic Jimmy DeVille gets his hands on an early noughties Audi S4. This V8 Super Saloon still has perfect engine performance, so this time it's about upgrading the onboard multimedia unit. Your first full electric car driving experience. Yeah. And Johnny tries to persuade committed petrol head Jimmy that electric cars are the future using Jaguar's game changing eye pace. Welcome to Fifth Gear. Now, it's fair to say that most cars, even bonkers supercars, are built with a measure of comfort and practicality. You know, they come with heaters, doors, windows, you know, that sort of stuff. But that all adds something that can limit potential driving fun. Weight. However, there's one breed of machine built with a different purpose in life, to let wannabe racing drivers go like the wind. I'm talking about these stripped-out sports cars. The heaviest car here weighs just 700 kilos, and the fastest gets to 60 miles an hour in 2.6 seconds. And to put that in context, there's no Lamborghini, Porsche or Ferrari currently on sale today that would beat it. So we thought we'd get four of the very best together to find out once and for all where you should put your money if your only priority is going fast. So let's introduce them. The Xenos E10R, the newest model of R4. The Radical SR1, designed purely for the track. The Caterham 620R, the oldest manufacturer here. And finally, Somerset's first supercar, the Aerial Atom 3.5R. All these two-seaters are British built, and all four together could be yours for less than the cost of a Lamborghini. But which is the cream of the crop? I need someone to help me decide. I need you, Karun Chanduk. And here I am. It's a fifth gear death match, so as usual, we'll be performing three tests. And at the end of each round, one car will drop out. We'll start by checking out their agility, because machines like this must have lightning reactions and be nimble around our tight test course. To ensure a fair result, JP has the keys to all four, while I'll stand by with the stopwatch. We'll start with the Xenos E10R. Its 2.3-litre turbo engine packs 354 horsepower, making it the most powerful car of our quartet. However, at 700 kilos, it's also the heaviest. From paper, it should do all right, but this test is all about nimble chassis. OK, three, two, one, go! <laughs> Not too bad on the wheels, but... Around the roundabout. Whoa. He's got it going, he's got it going! The <laughs> one, <laughs> oh, no. Not as clean around the roundabout, but let's see into the garage. Yeah, not too bad. Not too bad. Gets reversed here, all right. Up to the line. 28.13. It's really tricky to get it to move nicely at the rear. Next. Time for the Radical SR1. The Radical is the cheapest car by some way and also the least powerful with just 175 horsepower. However, at 490 kilos, it's also the lightest. Go! It's off the line. Bit of wheel spin at the start, but he's... He's not got a great turning circle, the Radical, but he's using his, uh, his right foot to get himself around the roundabout. That's working quite effectively. The SR1 is so track-focused, it's not actually road legal. But it's in our deathmatch because it's pretty special. And some people considering these types of machines might want all their thrills on the track. 
That was 26.34 for that one. I mean, it's epic. I mean, the engine's great, the gearbox works well. Yeah. It's a great thing, it sounds amazing. So, how will the Caterham do? The 620R is powered by a Ford engine, much like the Xenos, except this one's a two-litre supercharged one. So this should be great on the Autos S, because that's what these were kind of evolved to be good at over the years, you know, light, nimble. To me, this should be the winner here, but could be wrong, let's see. All right, oh, he's got an aggressive start on that one. At the roundabout is where the Caterham should come into its own. Not as quick to get in reverse as I would have expected, but anyway. Up to the line. 27.63, what do you reckon? That's it. What? It's in between the Xenos and the Radical. Time for the last car. Right, in the area that one now. Last time I drove this car, I loved it. I mean, it goes like stink. And that's down to a two-litre supercharged Honda engine that puts out 350 horsepower. Yet the car weighs just 550 kilos. But this test, of course, is not just about power. You've got to get off the line, but it's about agility. Mm. Let's see how we get on. Go! <laughs> That's quick. That's neat and tidy, but quick. A little bit aggressive in the roundabout. But he's able to balance it really well on the throttle. Much better than the other one. It's so loud. Twenty-five point one. That's miles quicker than anything else we've had here today. That is. It's I mean, quick, it's over it? a second quicker than anything else. Clear winner. I love this car. So the Atom wins our agility challenge, but more importantly, it means the Xenos must leave the contest. Join us later when the remaining three cars are subjected to a flat-out acceleration test. That was a lot quicker than I was expecting, I have to be honest. Now we're off for a fifth gear team test, and this time we've been joined by our mechanical marvel, Jimmy DeVille. So today, the team tested the Ford Fiesta ST. The last Fiesta ST, which came out in 2012, was highly acclaimed for its handling. So can the latest one match up or possibly be even better? Prices start at £19,245, but we're driving the mid-spec ST2 version, which costs a grand more. So, Ford Fiesta ST! It wasn't quite as exciting to look at as I hoped for. This has gone quite mature. It's a clean, well-appointed, not too leery looking car. I, I this think is a bit of class. Because I've lost a cylinder. What? Yeah. Now three cylinders. Oh, this is the three cylinder, I forgot, yeah. yeah. But not only does it only have three cylinders, but it'll actually run on two. Yes, you heard that correctly. When the car is being driven on a light throttle, it will actually run on two cylinders, further improving fuel consumption. But it's the same power as the four-cylinder outgoing model. Problem with downsizing engines is sometimes you take out the excitement in the quest for economy. Well, the great thing about this is if this car is as much fun as the last car and it does, like, ten more MPG... Yeah. ..happy days, Rock and right? Normally, when you're sat in the back of a car that size that's three-door and you're six-foot-three, it's an issue. Th even three What's door. it like in there? Hot. It's all it's right. hot in here. I've got oh! Well, have you got enough room? Yeah, I've got an inch well. before my knee touches anything. Tiff's got loads. Good. This car really has got some quality little touches. The chalk striping, just little things, it all comes together. Race track use only. There you go. Sounds quite good, eh? The only problem sitting in the back was Jason was driving. He immediately, you saw his eyes widen, he was like, I know this is going to be an exciting car. Oh, did you feel the rear just having a little bit of a... It's got engineered in. How to steer? Oversteer. It's got a good feel. The steering is nicely weighted, the driving position's good, the seats hug you well. We did soon find a small problem with the Fiesta. None of us have got oh, grab handles. Grab None of us. Corners, me and Johnny. I want to be out the back now. What, what are you getting out for? Gonna, we've got no doors. There's no escape hatches in the back. I'd had enough. With the loose dead weight thrown out, I could really show Jimmy what the car could do. It's got some get-up-and-go. It's a bit go-kart-like. 
And that's what you want in a fun little hot hatch. Great fun. I can't believe it's a 1500cc engine. It's going like something with a lot more of an engine. It's got the power when you need it. It's got the economy when you need it. This thing works. If a sporty little car like this is going to be sporty, you should be able to push it to a limit of discomfort. That's what I always think. So you can't push something that far, then it's a bit mediocre. All the way, all the way, all the way. I found that out. What was that? Hey. Shut your face. Get out of the car if you, you're not going to vomit, are you? I just, uh... Is that a sink perp? Re-swallow some Jaffa cake. Oh. oh! So the chuckable little Fiesta had proved chuckable in other ways. Scores, please. Little Fiesta ST didn't disappoint. It gets a nine. So I'm giving it a nine. Well done, Ford. I'm going to give it this. 8.5. I loved it, and I'm going to give it an eight. Which gives the Fiesta ST a team test score of 34.5 out of 40, the highest in the series so far. After the break, Vicky drives three super fast super minis that offer similar thrills to the Fiesta we've just driven, but could be yours for under five grand. <laughs> and Johnny takes Petrolhead Jimmy on an electric adventure to find out if Jaguar's new I Pace can convert him to life without fossil fuel. Yes! Earlier in the show, the Fifth Gear team tested the new Ford Fiesta ST, and there's no doubt it impressed. Great fun. I can't believe it's a 1500cc engine. Nevertheless, it still costs 20 grand. What if you only have a quarter of that? Can you still find something that's compact, quick and fun? Yes, I think you can. Take these three, for example. A Clio Renault Sport 182 Trophy, a Series 2 Mini Cooper S, and a Skoda Fabia VRS. All these speedy runabouts are now available with sensible miles and less than 13 years old for under five grand. I'll start with the Clio. I'm actually driving a bit of a collector's item because only 550 of these 182 trophies were ever made. The 182 Trophy, which went on sale in 2005, was dreamt up to clear out old stock. Renault took the standard 182 Clio, so-called because it had 182 horsepower, slapped on some fancy wheels, special paint and a numbered plaque, and hoped its rarity would justify the hefty 15 and a half grand price tag. In fact, Renault's marketing department was so uninterested in this car that they didn't bother keeping an example. So, I bet they were mightily surprised when Autocar got hold of one and declared it the world's greatest hot hatch. Why? Well, because Renault quietly fitted the trophy with some of the world's most trick suspension components, a set of Saks race engineering dampers. They cost a fortune and transformed a great car into an outstanding one. <laughs> So, if you want one, what must you watch out for? Well, first, check those precious Saks dampers, as the piston rods can corrode. Yes, they can be rebuilt, but if all four need some work, then it's going to add up. Cars like this are often abused, and the gearbox can be the first thing to go. If the gear lever moves under acceleration and deceleration, it's a sign that the mounts have gone. Car number two. An item about second-hand super minis really has to include a mini, and now £5,000 will comfortably get you into a second-generation Cooper S. The R56 model was launched in 2007, and although it looks very similar to the Series 1, it was in fact brand new from the bottom up. Engine, bodywork, the lot. And this Cooper S got its extra power from a more efficient turbocharger rather than the previous supercharger. The result is 172 brake horsepower from a 1.6 litre engine and 0-62 in 7.1 seconds. 
which is no different to the 0-62 type of the Clio. But what is different is the feeling inside the cabin. This car is made by BMW and boy can you tell, the fit and finish is fantastic. So what can go wrong? First up, check the clutch is working properly. These minis have a dual mass flywheel for smooth changes. If things go wrong, they can cost up to £1,000 to fix. And the brake discs can corrode if the car isn't driven for a long time. To replace these plus pads will cost you a little over £500. My final car is a bit of a sleeper. Now, you don't think about Skoda when you think about super minis, but they're rather very good at making them. And Skoda came up with a rather unusual way of getting performance from the power plant. Because the engine is boosted by a turbocharger and a supercharger. Turbochargers deliver lots of power, but are slow to react when you plant the throttle. Superchargers react instantly. However, they sap power from the engine. Combining smaller versions of both maximises the benefits while minimising the drawbacks. When you put your foot down, you really do get that sense of power. There's no slacking throughout the rev range. They have done a very good job. So, what can go wrong with the VRS? Now, listen carefully, because this is very serious. Early versions had a CAVE-coded engine, C-A-V-E, and they had serious piston and oil feed problems, resulting in about a third of them having engine failure. A film of oil around the exhaust is the first warning sign. For peace of mind, get a later car with a CHTE engine in it. They were fitted in 2012 and cured all the problems. And there's a sticker inside the driver's door to let you know which engine is fitted. So, three great super minis that won't break the bank. And now I have to pick my favourite. It is a really tough call. My head says those two, but my heart, which I'm going to be led by, says Cleo. It's the most enjoyable all-round drive. The number of electric cars on British roads has grown from 3,000 in 2012 to 130,000 in 2017. And in another five years, that's estimated to hit one million. Make no mistake, the EV revolution is coming, whether we like it or not. Plans are already afoot to cast out diesel and petrol engine older vehicles from city centres. The other thing is, the government has said it firmly intends to ban the production of fossil fuel powered cars totally. Now, don't get me wrong, I love the combustion engine, but for most of our everyday journeys, where comfort, cost, and practicality is the priority, electric cars make a compelling argument. There is somebody that I know of who doesn't quite agree with what I'm saying. And he's one of my fifth gear colleagues. He stood next to me. It's Jimmy DeVille. Thanks, Johnny. <laughs> That's a lovely introduction. <laughs> the problem, as I see it with electric cars, it's those batteries. Johnny, I wouldn't have got here to this lovely bubble museum if I was going electric. Yeah, you would. Amongst other things, Jimmy thinks electric cars have limited range, so I'm out to convince him that they truly work, and I'm starting here at the Bubble Car Museum. What are we doing at the Bubble Car Museum? Well, the reason why I brought you to such an obscure museum is just because my old car is actually here, which got me into electrification. In 2016, this 1974 Enfield powered me to an electric car quarter-mile world record of 9.86 seconds. It's faster than a Veyron. That's incredible. But how long does this run for? Um, I've done 40 miles in it on one charge. Exactly, Johnny. We're back to my battery issue. Electric cars have rubbish range. But I reckon I had a solution, and it was parked outside. If this couldn't convert Jimmy, nothing could. This is the new Jaguar I-Pace. Prices start at £63,000, which sounds expensive compared to Jaguar's petrol equivalent, the F-Pace, which costs from £42,000. However, the I-Pace's nearest upmarket EV rival, the Tesla Model X, starts at £80,000. So, first impressions. Right, what I am going to say about this car, forgetting my 
concerns and fears on the whole electrical thing, yeah. this interior, yeah. for me, is a triumph. It seems the interior had won Jimmy over, but I knew it wouldn't be long before he started banging on about range again. We've got just under 400 horsepower. And how long is this 400 horsepower going to be available to us? Well, uh, it has a theoretical... 298 miles. 298 miles. Um, theoretical. Theoretical. And what I would say is expect in the real world this to be about 230, 240. It really isn't as bad as I thought it could be. In fact, only the Tesla comes close in this SUV EV category when it comes to range. However, a petrol F-Pace would still get you a further 250 miles down the road. Now, what about charging the thing? Why have you got your phone out? Because all of these work mostly off apps. You know that bit a minute ago, we were talking about you starting to convert me? Yeah. This faff now... Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's starting to wane again. And I had another issue. It seems a 7.2 kilowatt charger like this will only give the car an extra 20 miles of range per hour of charging and costs £2.50 for the privilege. That's almost the same cost per mile as petrol. I'm going to start charging. But most of your recharging will take place at home, where you'll only pay £13 for a full charge. And that works out at less than half the cost of petrol. Plus, there are now around 1,450 kilowatt chargers dotted around the country, which will recharge this car to 80% in just 60 minutes. With lunch over, it was time to get Jimmy behind the wheel. This is exciting, cos your first full electric car driving experience. Yeah. And guess what he wanted to do first? Holy... Yes! Once he was behind the wheel, then we really started to see a change in Mr Deville. The, the face changed. <laughs> <laughs> wow! Electric cars, where have you been? In fact, this Jag has a whopping 696 newton metres of torque, and it can get to 62 in 4.8 seconds. A typical F-Pace will be around two seconds slower. The addiction of the instant throttle and the torque I can totally see it all coming into place. I wanted to absolutely hate it and say it was rubbish, it wouldn't do what I wanted it to do, but it does more than I wanted it to do and it felt as good as any other Jag I've ever driven. Dave said that these electric motors are 96% efficient. Well, you know, what's the most efficient combustion car engine probably achieving? In your 30s. And that's using 100 years of know-how. Yeah. You know what? I wanted to hate absolutely everything about today, but after driving the car, there is no question in my mind that it is extremely well executed. And everything I had to listen to Johnny Smith babbling on about, he's got some incredible points. This car and the whole EV revolution, it is all about taking the driving experience in a new direction. And if we embrace this with cars like this, it's going to be a future I want to be a part of. After the break, Jimmy gives a brutish Audi S4 a high-tech interior to rival any modern-day car. That's a nifty bit of kit. While Karun and I get low to the ground with a wind in our hair and continue our challenge to find the best superlight sports car for around 50 grand. I predict fireworks and a whole load of noise. Welcome back to our super light sports car death match, where we're featuring machines that go like stink. And that's about it, really. We're testing the Aerial Atom 3.5R, the Xenos E10R, the Caterham 620R, and the Radicals SR1. All cost under £53,000 and have the grunt to see off most supercars. However, test one was more about agility than pure power. And after Jason played hooligan around the cones with all four cars, we would have to say goodbye to the Xenos. Yeah, it's really tricky to get it to move nicely at the rear. Which leaves us with the Caterham, the Radical and the Aerial. So, we move on. And now it's time to really unleash the beasts. And by that, we mean a foot-to-the-floor acceleration test. Now, the manufacturers will often give figures about 0 to 60 times. And in the case of Caterham, they say this car, with 310 horsepower, will get to 60 
in 2.8 seconds. But we're going to make that test harder. So we've got a distance which is circa 400 meters, and we want to see the terminal velocity, how fast it will get to at those cones. Track focused cars like this need to accelerate hard well beyond 60 miles an hour if they're going to deliver decent lap times and the thrills their owners demand. So this test will find out if they have what it takes when three figure speeds are the objective. Now it's Karun's turn behind the wheel while I operate the speed gun. It's the best of two runs. So here I am in the K trim. Obviously very exposed, no windscreen, but it all feels quite clunky, if I'm honest. It's not the, the smooth flick of a switch or a, a quick shift like you've got in the other cars. It feels a little bit more old school. Let's see how he gets on. Here he comes. A 60, 80, 90, 100. 108 miles an hour, but it looked, looked like a bit of an effort. Traction problems on that Caterham. There's a lot of wheel spin in this Caterham off the line. It really, you feel the, the wheels just going and going and going, and then it starts to go. Oh, that's all right. It's all right. Lots of wheel spin, isn't yeah. there? Have really hard go. to get a trout power down. I'll have another go. I think that's easily beatable. That's impressive, isn't it? Uh, 112, that's all right. That's it's all right, isn't it? Yeah, that's all right. So the Caterham 620R sets the benchmark with a best speed of 112 mile an hour. Although it suffered a lack of grip initially, it then accelerated well through the gears. Next, the Atom. The 3.5R is the fastest of our cars to 60 mile an hour at an eye-watering 2.6 seconds. I predict fireworks and a whole load of noise. However, will it hold that advantage over our much longer course? Wow, the traction is so good! <laughs> Just sounds epic, doesn't it? That was a lot quicker than I was expecting, I have to be honest. 116 miles an hour. <laughs> it sounds... It is so quick. Fantastic. Oh, it sounds amazing as well. Isn't it brilliant? Yeah. I, I think maybe a little bit more off the line. But can the Atom go even faster? That's going to take some beating. It's so cool. So the Atom records an identical speed over run two. And by beating the Caterham, it's automatically through to the next round. The question is, which car will join it? Time for the SR1. The Radical might be the lightest car here, but it's also the least powerful by some margin. Consequently, its 0 to 60 time of 3.5 seconds is the slowest. Although its pure race bred nature and slippery aerodynamic body could make up for that. So if it wants to get into the final, it's got to beat the cage from 112 miles an hour. All right, here we go. Oh, he's away. The gear shift is really cool. Only 105. What do you reckon? It's just not quite got the grunt off the line. Whoa. You've got to get seven miles an hour more, otherwise that's, this goes home. That's a lot. I'm not sure. I'll have a go, but I'm not sure. Let's get a bit of temperature on the road tyres. Right, here we go. He's coming, he's coming. Come on, come on, Radical, come on. Well, the start felt a bit better. Let's see. What was it, 105 last time or 106? 
five last time. Oh, is it? Disappointingly, it's only 106. Sadly, there's not enough it's grunt, not there. is there? It's just not got enough grunt, unfortunately. Oh well. Take it home. So the aerial and caterham power through to our grand finale. Join us later to find out who will be crowned King of the Superlights as they battle wheel to wheel on the track. Now it's time for our mechanical marvel, Jimmy DeVille, to share some secrets on how to upgrade your car from the convenience of your driveway or garage. This week, we've got something rather special from Germany, the Audi S4. This 2003 V6 version packed a 339 horsepower V8 and thanks to a grippy four-wheel drive system, could get to 62 miles per hour in just 5.6 seconds. Make no mistake, these cars, which are now available for around £5,000, can keep up with just about any new car on sale today. However, there is one thing that really shows its age. It's got a tape deck, and that's something I'm going to solve. So, I've decided to upgrade the sound system with a top quality DAB radio and MP3 music streaming connectivity. However, this £450 head unit will also fully equip the car with sat-nav, Bluetooth hands-free cooling and I'm fitting a reversing camera to avoid unwanted bumps. Now, if you have a phobia of wiring and plugs, fear not because this is actually quite straightforward. It's a fiddly job, but all the parts are designed to come off and clip back easily, and is well worth the effort. You can upgrade the entertainment system of many older cars, and although you'll need a couple of specific tools, these are cheap and easily available online. First thing you need to get your hands on are a set of Audi radio removing tools. We've also got a couple of trim tools. Now these are to peel back the trim inside the car when we're hiding the wiring. Last thing we're gonna need is a battery drill and a set of drill bits put a few holes in for mounting things. Right, time to get to work. My first job is to remove the old head unit and then I can expose the wires. Right, to do that, I've got the Audi radio tools. And if you have a look at them, they've got writing on them. Number one, right, number one, right. So these go on the right and the writing is uppermost. And they slot is into two little slots, there and there. Most manufacturers have bespoke tools for this job. And again, you'll be able to find information regarding this online. I should be able to gently pull out the head unit. There it goes. Unplug the wiring. There are two multi-plugs at the back, plus the aerial cable. Most cars will have a similar arrangement. And that's my old head unit removed. <laughs> now I can see some space where my new wiring is going to go, and I can see immediately that I'm going to have to run the wiring for the camera and the aerial behind the glove box. So next job, this glove box is coming out. To get the glove box out, there's just five bolts. Two underneath, two inside, and one behind this cover here. The panel that hides the fifth bolt simply unclips. When you're fitting the area, you can put it anywhere on the inside of the window you want. So I'm putting it in the bottom so you can't really see it. Then it's just a case of hiding the wire, which is where the trim tool comes in handy. Right now, I'm only going to put the wires in loosely. At the end, I'll make sure it's all fastened away nice and neat. Our multimedia unit permits safe, legal, hands-free calls, so I'll need to fit a microphone. To get this close to the driver's mouth, a couple of panels below and to the side of the steering wheel must be removed. Don't be scared, they come off easily and you'll be amazed at the extra space behind the plastic. Now it's time to attach the microphone itself. So I've got a little sticky pad on it and it's just gonna go up on the windscreen in the corner so it's tucked away a little bit neater. And then it's just a case of routing the cable behind the windscreen trim and underneath the dashboard. The last one that needs fitting is the camera. Now, that's going to go in the rear, and that means a whole load of trim is going to need to be neatly removed to get that wire in. Make no mistake, the next stage can be fiddly. 
but all it needs is a bit of patience. Every car will be a little different and you'll find advice online about how and where to route the cable. Having fed the cable through the passenger compartment, you then get to the boot lid, which requires removing two large trim panels. These are secured by means of plastic clips and screws. OK, that's the camera wire run right from the front all the way to the back via all the trim. I've actually had to come up through the hinge and that's got it into the boot lid. Now the camera is going to go on this little lip right here to keep it neatly out of the way. So I'm actually going to have to drill a hole through there to run the cable through. Yes, I'm drilling through the bodywork of my lovely Audi, but it's only a small hole. With the camera in place, you just connect it to the cable you've fed through the car. And use a few nylon cable ties to neaten everything up. First thing is fascia, and that just simply clicks in. Now the cage for the radio fits into that fascia. And what I need to do is bend some of these tangs to lock it in. When you buy the head unit, you specify the car you'll be fitting it to, which means you'll get a bespoke fascia, cage and wiring kit. So all the cables should simply click into place. The final electrical job is to connect up the head unit. And then the head unit just slides into the new cage. That's the head unit in. And the final, final job is to clip or screw back any trim you've removed. Right, first things first, I need to take this S4 out for a test drive and see just how good this head unit is. I'm also going to need to find myself a car parking space to try out that rear view camera. Let's go. The first thing I wanted to check out was the hands-free capability. Call cool, Paul, cut down cars. Hello. You right, Paul? It's me. Hi, mate. What are you up to? Just calling you to try out this new head unit. How do I sound? Yeah, you sound clear enough. What about me? Mate, clear as a whistle and no hands needed. I'm loving it. Point two, no longer is there a need for me to stick some sucker thing to my windscreen blocking my view because it's got built-in satellite navigation. Tidy. Lastly, I wanted to test the parking camera. Into reverse, and I should get a picture. There you go. Everything should be fine. Steadily back. That really works. That's a nifty bit of kit. All in all, the job had taken three hours and cost me under 500 quid. My S4 now had a multimedia system to rival anything on the road and future-proof the car for another 20 years. After the break... Hi, ah, wheel spin, wheel spin, wheel spin. It's the finale of our death match. Which one of our 50 grand flyweight specials will win around the track and take the overall honours? Fabulous fun to drive. What? <laughs> Welcome back to the final part of our stripped out sports car challenge featuring track orientated cars with only one purpose in life, going flipping fast. We started with four of the best examples available, all of which cost less than £53,000. But this is a take no prisoners knockout contest, so we've now lost two of the contenders. The Xenos failed to make the cut when it came to some fleet footed manoeuvres through the cones. And a radical couldn't cut the mustard when we put pedal to the metal in our acceleration contest. Which leaves us with these, the Aerial Atom and the Catron. Now, both of these cars are designed to go around racetracks, so appropriately, we're going to finish with a race. Who drives which? Well, you're a bit shorter than me, so you, right. can, have the, you can have the small one. I'm having the big one. Oh. It's a race over two laps. We're going to do a rolling start. I've given um, Karun the inside line for turn one because I actually think this car's quite a bit better than the Catrum. It's an age thing. I've got to let the old man have a nice, comfortable drive. I'm going to take the Bucking Bronco. Winner gets to spray champagne and kiss the pretty girl. 
Right, and we're off. Here we go. <laughs> wheel spin, wheel spin, wheel spin. But I've got the inside for the first corner. Okay, get it through. Whoa. One thing you'll notice is that the Catrum's pretty quick in a straight line, but it will struggle for traction. The front end of the Catrum's are so light relative to the other cars. And a light front end means a lack of grip, which gives the car a very nervous and unpredictable feel. Oh, make sure he doesn't get past. Yes. Go, 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 go. <laughs> I am driving the defensive race. It's the only way I'm going to win this. <laughs> this Atom has got fabulous traction in comparison to the k -Trum. It's very much more drivable, I think. Too much oversteer there. He's got to run on me to the outside. I think we've had enough of this. Should we blast past him down here? Oh! Yeah, just way too much speed. That aerial is so hooked up in the fast corners. This thing, I'm fighting with it. I'm having to battle it. JP can easily just shift mid-corner. And... Right, here we go on the grass there. <laughs> just flick of a swish. Well, I clunk and pop away, battling with this death. Do you know what? She's got beautiful composure and grip. Great front end. Don't bite me, please don't bite me, please don't bite me, please don't bite me. Thank you. It's fabulous fun to drive. Why? <laughs> I mean, it is great fun, don't get me wrong, but he's just pulling further and further away with every slide that I have, every gear shift I need to make. He's just edging further away from me. He can't live with us. <laughs> no chance. I could drive this car all day long. It's balanced, it's fun, it's enjoyable. I've got some space. How was your limousine? Mate, this thing is just amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Thanks to a perfect blend of balance, traction, lightness and power, the Atom won all three challenges by a country mile. <laughs> It may not be ideal for the shopping run, but when it comes to some fun through the country lanes or flat out on the track, the 3.5R reigns supreme. And here's something even more worrying for the opposition to think about. Next year, the Atom 4 comes out. But I'm saving that for the next series.